Well, the good news of Jesus Christ, the the Christian worldview, stands as one truth claim among a whole marketplace of ideas. This was true in the first century, and it is equally true in the 21st century. Our high school and our college students know this as they are confronted with the reality of the marketplace of ideas on their campuses each and every day. And the rest of us feel this too. And despite the wishes of the pluralists and the demands of the politically correct police, if Christianity is true, if Jesus Christ really did live, die, and rise from the dead, then all other truth claims are false. Scientific naturalism and the gospel cannot both be true at the same time. Islam and the gospel cannot both be true at the same time. Hinduism and the gospel cannot both be true at the same time. Buddhism and the gospel cannot both be true at the same time. For these are conflicting truth claims. This is logical and rational, and yet so many of us have not thought this through. And so we take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a dash of this and a pinch of that, and we construct our own worldviews a mishmash of incoherent, irrational, and conflicting ideas. That's many of us. This happens today, and it was happening way back in the first century as well. It's the reason why the Apostle Paul picked up his pen, and he wrote this letter to the church at Colossae. If you're a guest with us here at Grace Central Coast, you're visiting here at Grace Slow or Grace Five Cities, we're really, really glad that you're here. Thanks for worshiping with us. We are in the middle of a series we've titled Route 66, where uh, it's really a road trip across the Bible. Each week we're, we're looking at, we're exploring one of the 66 books of the Bible. We started way back in the book of Genesis, and we worked our way all the way through the Old Testament, and now we're about halfway through the New Testament, and uh, we come this morning to the book of Colossians. The New Testament is organized by genre, and right in the middle of the New Testament is a, a group of 13 letters written by one man written by the Apostle Paul. Nine of these letters are written to local churches, just like our local church. These letters, uh, these these are real Christians living uh, in real families. They uh, They have real jobs, and they're living in a real surrounding community. The book of Colossians is one of these nine letters, and it was written to a church in the city called Colossae. It's clear in the letter that Paul did not plant the church at Colossae. He planted many of the churches to whom he writes, but not the church of Colossae. In fact, Paul has never even been to the church at Colossae. Turns out that a guy named Epaphras, a close companion of Paul, preached the gospel and planted the church in Colossae. And the gospel has taken off there in this church Uh, It's increasing and bearing much fruit among the Colossians and in this surrounding community. And yet, Paul writes this letter because the church at Colossae is in danger. They are a young church filled with young Christians living among a marketplace of ideas. False ideas, heresies are creeping into the church and have put the faith of the Colossians at great risk. These false false ideas are never specifically identified in the letter, and yet they are alluded to at several points, and I wanted to show you that. So follow along with me. Take a look at chapter 2, verse 4. Look what Paul says. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible plausible arguments. Watch out, he's saying. He says in chapter 2, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. There's a philosophical element to the false heresies that are creeping into the church at Colossae, but there's also a legalistic element as well. Paul says in chapter 2, verse 16, "'Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism 
and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Again, it was probably not one idea, one false idea, but a bundle of false ideas that endangered the church at Colossae. Speculative philosophical arguments, useless laws, worshiping of angels even, fantastical, prideful visions. And so Paul writes this letter to warn and to rescue the Colossians from these false ideas. How does he do that? How does Paul aim to warn and rescue the Colossians from these false ideas? By highlighting the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Paul aims to show that Jesus is absolutely supreme, higher and qualitatively better than all these lesser and false ideas. Paul aims to show that Jesus is all-sufficient, more than enough to save our souls, more than enough to meet our needs, more than enough to satisfy our deepest longings. We don't need any additives, any preservatives, any artificial sweeteners. Jesus is more than enough. That's the theme of Colossians. That's what the letter to the Colossians is all about, the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. So what I want to do in our short time together as we come to the Lord's table today is to quickly show you how Paul shows the Colossians the supremacy and absolute all-sufficiency of Jesus, and then how this is meant to impact our lives, how the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus is meant to impact our lives in four big ways. A couple quick notes before we begin. The book of Colossians, I just am convinced, it's so relevant for Christians today. It's so practical for you and I today. We live like they lived in a pluralistic, politically correct world. The false ideas that threaten the Colossians equally threaten our faith and the faith of our children. We too desperately need to see and trust the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. We need to teach these truths to our children. They, our children need to see that Jesus is supreme and all-sufficient for our lives and for their lives. I love the book of Colossians so much. I think it's so practical for you and I that I chose it as the very first book to teach through 13 years ago when I first came to Grace. This was the title of that series, Jesus Christ, Supreme and Sufficient. I preached 21 messages from the book of Colossians. Today we're going to do it in one, okay? So that's a great challenge in front of us. And uh, it, perhaps you hear something that challenges you today, something that intrigues you. I want to let you know that all 21 messages from Colossians are posted on our website. You can go and listen to them. You just go to gracecentralcoast.org and you click the watch and listen menu and you look for this banner and you can listen to all those 21 messages on the book of Colossians. So that's the first note. The second note is that if you're here today and you wouldn't identify yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian today, um, I think t today this study in Colossians is a great opportunity for you to grapple with the truth claims of Jesus Christ, to grapple with the Christian worldview, because the truth claims of Jesus, what Christians believe about Jesus, are so clearly laid out here in the book of Colossians. So I hope that this is a great challenge for you and um, spurs your thinking and, uh, and really challenges you as, you as you continue to grapple with the Christian faith. So grab that outline in your worship folder and open up that one side. You're going to see there a chart, and it looks just like this. We're going to work our way through the book of Colossians by building this chart together. Let's begin in, the, in that middle square and see just how Paul argues for the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. The way he does this is he uses two passages, and I want, you, I want to look at them in turn with me, okay? Take a look at the first one, chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. It was actually our call to worship today. Take a look at it. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He, that is God the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's an introduction there. Both Christ's supremacy and all sufficiency are hinted at. Jesus, the Son of God, has a kingdom, and God has transferred you and I, those who trust Jesus, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. If Christ has a kingdom, it means that Christ is a king, a supreme king. The, the, the supremacy of Jesus is hinted at here. But in Him also we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He is not only the supreme king, but Jesus is our all-sufficient Savior, the Savior of our souls. In Him we have redemption. All of that is just an introduction. It's a tease. Now the detail. Follow along in verse 15. First, Christ's supremacy. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. What is Paul asserting here? That Jesus is Lord of all things. Jesus is Lord of all things, all creation. Not some things, but all things, anything and everything that exists, all things were created by Him and through Him and for Him. In Him, all things hold together. He is the glue of the universe. He is the maker and the sustainer and the ruler of all things. Jesus is the Lord of life. He is called here the firstborn of all creation and also the firstborn from the dead. So that in everything, Jesus might be preeminent, first and above all, supreme. That's what preeminent means. It means supreme, first and above all. But now Paul turns a corner from the creation work of Jesus to the salvation work of Jesus. Paul moves from Christ's exaltation above all things to His incarnation and His humiliation at the cross. From Christ's lordship over all things to His sacrifice for you and I. From Christ's supremacy to Christ's sufficiency for us. Verse 19, For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. What is Paul asserting in these verses? That Jesus is Savior of all peoples. The one and only Savior of all peoples, Jews and Gentiles like these Colossians, Jews and Gentiles like you and I, people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, all of us were hostile in mind, doing evil deeds apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were hostile, when we were waging war against God, He waged peace through the blood of His cross. When we were living in rebellion, He laid His body down for our reconciliation. Paul is arguing that what Jesus accomplished is more than enough, all sufficient for you and I. Peace has been made. Reconciliation has been accomplished. We don't need additional philosophies. We don't need useless roles. We can add nothing to the finished work of Jesus. It is finished. It's not half done. It is finished. Paul picks up this theme 
of the all-sufficiency of Jesus again. In the second passage, I want you to see, this time, chapter 2, verse 9, it was our scripture reading this morning, for in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. In Him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism in which you also in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. What is Paul saying in these verses? A lot, but among the many things that he's saying, Paul is saying that Christ is victor over all enemies. Jesus has triumphed over death itself. He has been raised from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. And He has raised us up from spiritual death. We who are dead in our trespasses, He's made us alive together with Him. Jesus has triumphed over sin, having canceled out the certificate of debt against us, God's legal demands, God's just demands. All that God demanded of you and I, all that we fail in God's law, He has nailed that certificate of debt to His cross. It has been nailed to His cross and paid for. Jesus has triumphed over rulers and authorities at the cross. He's put them to open shame while Paul may be talking about earthly rulers. He's more likely speaking of spiritual rulers and authorities. The devil and his demons at the cross, the enemies of Christ thought that they had won But what looked like defeat was really victory in disguise. Do you see how the supremacy and all sufficiency of Christ are woven together in this second passage? Christ's great victory over all his enemies is for us. His enemies are our enemies. His victory is our victory. We are more than conquerors in him. You see, this is high-octane, concentrated stuff. These might be the most Christologically rich and highly concentrated passages concerning the person and work of Jesus in all the New Testament. Why? Why? What is Paul's purpose? Why does he bring it on here? To convince the Colossians and you and I of the absolute supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Why does Paul want us to know the supremacy and all sufficiency of Jesus Christ? Why did the Colossians need to know it? Why does Paul exhort them to walk in Christ and keep seeking the things above where Christ is? What are these truths, the supremacy and the all sufficiency of Jesus meant to, how are they meant to impact our lives, influence our lives? The rest of the book of Colossians suggests at least four ways that the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ should impact our lives. I think there's a lot more than four ways, but we're going to highlight four together. Here they are quickly. They're the circles on your chart there. First, the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus give us the assurance of the hope of glory. What does this mean, the hope of glory? Look at the way Paul talks about it at the end of chapter 1. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the Word of God fully known. Look what he says here, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to His saints." To them, that is to us, to the Colossians, and to us, God's saints, 
God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What's the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the great mystery of God, hidden for long ages and generations, but now revealed to us His saints. What is the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. He calls it the hope of heaven at another place in this letter to the Colossians. He's talking about a glorious, fantastic, beyond our wildest dreams, life beyond this life. A life that will never end. A life in and with Christ Himself. This is why Jesus, the Lord of all things, the Savior of all peoples, the victor over all enemies, has come to give you and I, to guarantee for us a hope of glory. He has made peace through His body on the cross in order that we might have this hope of glory. Susie and I, we sat with a dear friend last night as his wife lay dying, and we cried together and we spoke together of our shared hope of, hope of glory. We talked about our hope. We talked about the party, the glorious, beyond our wildest dreams party that is coming. We talked about his wife. She's, gonna, she's, she's going to the party. She's right there. The party is hers. The supreme Christ has laid down his life to bring you to the party, to give you a hope of glory. Is it yours? Do you have a hope of glory this morning? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can you say with confidence that yours is a hope of glory? Do you know that it's a gift offered to you today? Christ has come to give you the gift. It can be yours. You can leave this place with a hope of glory. If you will trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you look upon Christ supreme and all-sufficient for the forgiveness of your sins, for a relationship with God, and you say, I want that, I trust that. Hope of glory, it's yours. Reach out and grab hold of it today. The second way that the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ can and should and will impact our lives is, provi is by providing for us a firewall against empty ideas and useless rules. You know what a firewall is, don't you? It's an extra thick fireproof wall that pr protects one building structure from another building structure that might be on fire. So it stops the fire. The fire can come to the wall but get no further. There's actually a firewall uh, between this building, the building we're sitting in, and the next building. It's a double thick wall and it's meant to be a firewall. If, if, God forbid, you know, if this were to light on fire, catch on fire, or let's say that were to catch on fire, we would be safe. The fire would come no further. If you know, really know, if you believe, if you're captivated by the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Jesus, all that Paul teaches us here in Colossians 1 and 2, that will provide for you a wall of protection, a firewall against false ideas, heresies of all kinds. If your kids, if you are intentional to instruct your kids, you're passionate to instruct your kids, you, do, you show them that Christ is supreme and all-sufficient for you, and you teach them that Christ is supreme and all-sufficient for them, you will be building a firewall in the lives of your kids against false ideas, empty ideas, and useless rules, heresies of all kinds. You know how federal agents learn to uh, spot counterfeit dollar bills, right? I have a $100 bill here. How do we know if it's uh, real or a counterfeit? You know how federal agents are trained not by studying counterfeit bills, but rather by studying 
the genuine article, knowing the real thing so well, so intimately, that they immediately spot the counterfeits. Paul is training the Colossians and us in the real thing so that we can easily and readily spot a counterfeit, so that we won't fall for a counterfeit. That's what chapter 2 of Colossians is all about, the real thing and counterfeits. Third way, the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ can, will, should impact our lives is by informing how we live in every sphere of our lives. Paul aims to show that the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus, this is really practical, that it, it, it really should inform every single area of our lives. So all the way through chapter 3 and in the first part of chapter 4, that's what he shows. He shows what a Christ-centered life looks like in different spheres. And so uh, in chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, he talks about Christ-centered purity, Christ-centered private life. Uh, holiness before God and, and what that looks like and how we can live holy lives, Christ-centered lives before God. Uh, verses 9 through 17 of chapter 3 are about Christ-centered church life, and we're going to say a little bit more about this in a second. Chapters, uh, uh, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 are about Christ-centered marriage, husbands and wives, and how we put Jesus Christ at the center of our marriage relationships. Uh, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3 are about Christ-centered parenting, how we put Jesus at the center of our relationship between kids and parents, parents and kids. Chapter 3, verses 22 through chapter 4, verse 1 are all about uh, how we take Jesus Christ to work, how we work to please God and what that looks like. Chapter 4, verses 2 through 6 are about Christ-centered living in the community, how we serve as light in the broader community, how we live missionally in the broader community, and uh, what it looks like to live for Christ in a broader community. So as you look, about, as you look at those various areas, as you think about how Jesus Christ, His supremacy and His sufficiency are intended to inform every area of your life. Think about the areas of your life. Is there an area that is, that is still untouched by the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Jesus? Is there an area in your life, maybe not just these areas, but any area in your life where Christ is not a part of that? Christ has no place in that area. Why is that? And how can the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus begin to inform and shape that area of your life that's still untouched by Jesus? That's what's supposed to happen. That's where the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Jesus takes us. There's a fourth way that the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus should, will, can impact our lives. It should create in us a radical commitment to a new church family. We've already said something about this in this list of areas that Paul gives us in chapter 3, but this one really jumped out at me. I don't know if you've been noticing it, but in every single one of these letters we've been looking at, Paul takes quite a bit of space and time to talk about our fellowship in the church, our shared life together. Uh, life in the local church. He just has a lot to say about this because I think commitment to a church is, is uh, something countercultural. It's something uh, odd and strange to us, but it's what God pushes us into. It's what Christ uh, shapes us into. We are the body of Christ. We're thrown together, linked together as the body of Christ. We're called into a committed life together. And, and it is. It's strange. It's countercultural. It's strange in our day. It was strange in their day. Every single church, our church included, we fall woefully short of the scriptural ideal what God desires for us. It's true. We don't measure up. We're not there yet. We haven't arrived. And yet, I think what, what Paul intends for us, what God intends for us is to keep seeing, seeking, and striving for the ideal. Not give up 
What is the ideal? It's this. Take a look with me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Think about our relationships, our, our Sunday mornings, our life and growth groups, all the things, all the life that we live together as a church. Is this the way you're experiencing our life together? How can we move toward this kind of life together? Look at it. Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, and sooner or later there will be complaints against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is the kind of community that God desires for His people. It's the kind of community that the supremacy and all sufficiency of Christ call us into, into a radical commitment to an all-new community together. It's why God has given us his supreme and all-sufficient Son, in order that we might experience, we might strive together for this kind of community. The forgiveness of Christ, the peace of Christ, the Word of Christ are to saturate our community together. The forgiveness of Christ, the peace of Christ, and the Word of Christ are to saturate our community together. Are you committed to this kind of community? Are you striving together with others here at Grace toward this kind of community? Yeah, we, we fall so short, but let's not give up. Or are you just coming? You, you come and you punch your time card, you punch in, you punch out, you walk in the door, you walk out the door, and that's it. No, the Lord calls us to so much more. This kind of community, it implies an intimacy. It, it implies a leaning in. We have such a long way to go. We admit that together. But let us continue to strive toward this Christ-centered community that God calls us to. Four ways that the supremacy and all sufficiency of Jesus Christ should impact, will impact, can impact our lives. The assurance of the hope of glory, the party's coming. A firewall against empty ideas and useless rules for us and for our kids. Christ-centered living in every sphere of life. And a commitment, a radical commitment to a new church family. And so we come to this table. God's Word in Colossians and this table together were given so that we might remember the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. This table, this table is for all who are trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It's for those who say, yes, Jesus is supreme and all-sufficient, more than enough for me. If it's you, come and eat, come and remember, come and feast upon all that Jesus is for you. This table's for you. Perhaps you're here today and something's happened. You've turned a corner. You, you've been grappling with the Christian worldview, the truth claims of Jesus. And today, you're beginning to believe them. Some things have come together for you. And you, you say, I want that hope of glory. I want the forgiveness of my sins. I realize that I need a Savior. What do you do? How do you move from belief to unbelief? How do you come into this family of God, this new community. Here's a prayer that can be a guide for you. The words aren't magic, but they're meant to be, meant to be an expression of the trust of your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Lord of all things, the Savior of all peoples, and the victor over all enemies. Thank you for dying for my sins. Today, I put my trust in you and begin to follow you. Help me believe 
you are all sufficient for the salvation of my soul and the satisfaction of my deepest longings. Amen. If you are praying that prayer for the first time today, this table's for you. We'd love to know that. Tell us on a next step card. Let us know that uh, you're trusting Jesus today for the first time. But this table is for you. Come and eat. Come and feast upon Jesus, all that He is for you. If you're here today and uh, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not ready to commit your life to Him, uh, we're really glad that you're here. We want you to feel welcome. We want you to understand what we do and why we do it. We don't want you to feel awkward, but we do want to make clear that bread and cup are for those who are trusting Jesus today, those who are identifying themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. So just let those trays pass you by. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then you're going to have a little bit of time to confess your sins. The servers are going to come forward at that time. We're going to pass the trays, and then we're going to take bread and cup and turn together at both our campuses at Grace Low and down at Grace Five Cities. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, all that we need, you have accomplished. There is no other Savior but Christ our Lord. He is the Lord of all things the Savior of all peoples, and the victor over all our enemies. And we praise Him today. We come to this table that He has given to us, and we feast upon all that He is for us. We, uh, We fix our eyes on Him, and we receive His grace once more. We thank You that You've given this table to us so that we might remember. We pray for any who are coming to the table for the first time, thank you for what you're doing in their lives. Help them, give them confidence, assure them of the hope of glory, Christ in them, even as they come. We pray for those who are not yet ready today. We, we just pray that even as you have caused dead sinners like me to come alive to faith in you, we pray that, that you would be doing that uh, in the hearts of others, the souls of others as well. We want to be a part of that process however we can. And so we come to you, Lord Jesus, we fix our eyes on you, we feast upon all that you are for us. We thank you, we praise you, you are worthy of our worship and praise, and we offer it to you now as we come, in Christ's name, amen.